Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, for the power, for the wisdom, for the comfort, for the strength, for the amazing truth it gives to us. We thank you that your Holy Spirit guides us through your word and teaches us what it means to us today. And that's our prayer this morning, that you will guide us through your word, help it to enhance and grow our faith. And may my words be your words as we seek to learn and grow together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I said, today is a very special day in the life of our church. Four ladies have come forward to say, I want to publicly profess Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. And we are thankful and grateful, and all heaven is turning cartwheels as we're doing that, because they are thrilled at their faithfulness to do this. Now, Jesus commanded his followers to baptize believers in his great commission to the disciples, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And for 2,000 years, the Christian church has obeyed that commandment. We have baptized people who believe. Now, Many people have different traditions with baptism, and I don't have the time to discuss all of those today. And that's okay, they have various beliefs, but my focus is on us as Baptists today. How do we do it, and why do we do it the way we do? For us, baptism is done by what is called immersion, which means basically putting somebody under the water. And I heard one Christian comedian say, you know the word baptism in the original Greek says, put them under till they bubble. <laughs> well, I don't know if we're going to do that. But it is a way to symbolize death and resurrection. And that's why we choose the mode to do that. Interestingly, this is symbolizing two situations like that. First of all, the person being baptized is symbolizing their death to the old and their resurrection as a new believer in Christ, but they're also proclaiming Jesus' death and burial and his resurrection from the dead by undergoing baptism. So this is a very powerful witness. See, it loudly proclaims our Christian faith to the world. Now, there have been many people who have distorted the meaning of baptism. Um, some people will say, well, that's what you do for a child to give them a Christian name. Well, I'm sorry, but you as a parent can give your child a name. You don't need to have any kind of ceremony for that. Baptism, to have meaning, must have someone able to proclaim that for themselves. And that's why we do it the way we do. It marks us as saved believers in Jesus Christ. And every one of the ladies who is coming forward here has professed faith in Christ. And they will be making a brief statement to that fact before they get baptized. Just so that you, as the body of Christ, can be assured that we're not you know, drowning unbelievers here this morning. We're not going to hold them down until they repent and accept Jesus. <laughs> but let's look briefly here what Paul says about baptism from our passage uh, in Romans chapter 6, 1 through 7. This is one of a few different um, passages in the New Testament about baptism. Paul begins by saying, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Now he's making the argument, look, we are saved from our sins not because of our good works, but because of God's grace, because of his love for us. Nothing that we did saves us. But we are changed by that grace when we believe. We no longer live in sin. Our state of our soul state is not fallen any longer. It's not dead spiritually any longer. And so he's saying, well, look, we are different when we've accepted Jesus. 
he goes on to explain this a bit further in the next verse. He says, May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? See, if we've died to sin because Jesus died in our place, how can we still be in a sinful state? Of course we can't, is the argument Paul is making. We are no longer sinners. We're saved. And then he makes the tie-in for us for baptism in the next verse. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? As I said before, baptism is also a symbol for the believer to proclaim Jesus' death. To proclaim his substitutionary death for us on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And that's part of what they're proclaiming today. He goes on. Therefore, we have been buried with him through death, or through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. I'll continue that verse in a second. Baptism symbolizes the death and burial of our old sinful selves. That's what the lying back under the water symbolizes. And I know churches have fought over whether it's the right way to do it backwards, forwards, sideways, whatever. But the symbolism of lying back is taking the death position, so to speak, being prone like you're lying in a casket. I hate to be morbid about that, but that's part of it. The old sinful self is dead. And we're saying that. But then, it also symbolizes Jesus' resurrection in our lives. The rising up again out of the water is like being raised from the dead. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so we too are raised from the dead of sin, the death of sin. We are alive in Jesus. And that second part of the ceremony, when the person comes back up, symbolizes that they are now a new creature in Christ. Jesus has taken away the old, and they are no longer enemies of God. They are now children of God. So this is a very powerful symbol, and Paul is helping us to understand that here. The second part of that verse, he says, So we too might walk in newness of life. And this is the follow-up to that. You see, after we accept Christ, that's not the end. That's the beginning of the new life he has for us. That's the beginning of our eternal life. We have brand new lives we can walk with the Lord in after we have accepted Jesus. And that's what Paul wants them to understand. You are not who you were. You are different. You are clean. You are God's child now that you've accepted Jesus. And that coming up out of the water symbolizes that new person has begun to live. He goes on to repeat the idea here. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. He's also talking here about our literal resurrection from the dead. That will happen one day. We will be raised from the dead, never to die again. And that's all because Jesus was the first one to conquer death. He was raised from the dead, never to die again. Paul calls it the first fruits in 1 Corinthians 15. He was the first one to conquer death, and he passes that life on to us so that we too will conquer death one day and be alive forever. And again, he says in the next verse, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with. Jesus died in our place on the cross. That paid for our sins and led to the death of our old sinful selves. Paul's repeating himself here for emphasis. He doesn't want anybody to misunderstand. You see... 
the normal, fallen human way of looking at things is, I'm not a bad person. God will save me just because I do nice things for people. (laughs) No, it doesn't work that way. You see, you could be somebody who donates millions to charity and then you go out and shoot somebody in cold blood. When you stand before the judge, he's not going to say, well, I see you gave a lot of money to charity, therefore you're not guilty of murder. No. We all sin. You see, the Bible only has two groups of people listed in it. All... All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're all in the same boat. We're all lost. We're all sinners. And the second group is whosoever. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. From John 3.16. So you're either in one group or the other. We all started in the all category. All were sinners. But we can be in the whosoever category if we believe in Jesus. And that's what he's explaining here. And that's how he's tying this into baptism, why it's so important. So that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Despite what all the self-help gurus say, There's no way to fix yourself spiritually. You can't just decide, tomorrow I'm going to be sin free. We don't have that power as human beings. But in Jesus, we are set free from sin. We are no longer slaves to sin because we have the Holy Spirit within us now, the power of God within us now, and He cleanses us because Jesus paid for our sins. And then he wraps up this idea with this. For he who has died is freed from sin. See, for those who are in Jesus, sin doesn't follow us into the next life. If you die without Jesus, you get to pay for your own sins forever. I'm sorry to say. But if you have Jesus, sin stops at the grave. And the life we have in heaven forever is perfect. And full of joy and peace and love. In other words, he's saying, in Jesus we're free. We have Him as our source of life. As our Savior. The ladies today are celebrating and declaring that freedom through their act of obedience in being baptized here today. They're proclaiming to all of you that they are free. No longer slaves of sin. That promise of whosoever is for everyone. There is no one who is too sinful. There is no one who God doesn't love. There is no one who can't be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit if they believe. My point is, Jesus died for anyone. Whosoever is a pretty broad term. And the only condition is you have to believe. Ask for forgiveness for your sins, turn to Jesus and trust Him as your Savior and your Lord. That's all there is to it. It's not always easy. But if we don't have to put ourselves in that religious treadmill where we just keep going around and around and around trying to do good to please God, do good to please God, do good to please God, and get nowhere, then we are truly free. Free to love others. Free to love God. Free to care about the needs of other people. Free to share what God has blessed us with with others. Free to teach the young how to believe in Jesus. Free to impact our culture to say, hey, here is the answer to all of our problems. That's what we're proclaiming today. And I want to move into that next part of our service now. We want the ladies to be ready because we're going to start this in just a minute. I'm going to also, but before we 
do that, let's close in prayer and prepare for the next part of our service. Lord, thank you for dying for us. Thank you for ra- for raising from the dead for us. Thank you that we can symbolize that through baptism. Thank you for the faith of these ladies who are willing to make this public stand for you. And I pray, Lord, that if there be anyone else here who doesn't know you, that they will surrender to you as well, to be free from sin. Thank you, Lord, for these amazing promises you give us. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.